first of all, I want to say thank you for the folks that I recognize here because the fact that you came to the third session on the last day at four o'clock, it's a pretty big deal. <laughs> exactly. Best of the last. Yeah, everyone is always the better, uh, the best. Um, the, the best part about this one is that I'm going to talk very little. And you already met Ajay. I really wanted him to actually, um, you know, come up and help um, kick this off because he actually runs the partner program. So all of the, uh, the governance ready certification is done through this gentleman. So he's the important one here. So I think you guys have seen the slide several times. I mean, the idea is that we want to basically maintain metadata with the payload across different platforms. This is pretty obvious. Everybody needs to do this. And we really want to uh, make good on this promise um, by not just doing things with Atlas, but also being able to extend our capabilities with our partner group. So there's a lot of things that our platform doesn't necessarily handle well, just because of the scope or just because um, of our focus, right? And there's a very rich um, ecosystem of partners we want to foster um, and vendors that our customers may already be using. And we want to integrate them so we can actually use a common uh, metadata store. And that's actually what the Governance Ready Certification is all about. Aji's been working hard with his team to make sure that we are integrating them well. And actually, we have the, uh, a really great opportunity to show demos on this, right? So we're going to start off with Waterline. Mohan, who's actually already here, I kicked him off, sorry. Uh, Ativa, and then we're gonna wrap up with Trifacta. And then we're gonna have a complete, pl another plug. Turns out it's gonna be in this room. We can extend the talk, and we can talk um, in perhaps uh, further detail, break up into smaller groups if necessary, for a birds of a feather session. Just because you haven't had enough governance, we can extend that all the way to seven o'clock, which is kind of late, but if you, if you want to stay, I'm, I'll be here as well. So with that, I'm going to actually unplug my laptop and hand it over to Mohan. And while he's setting up, um, we, can, we can take some questions if you like. So anybody out here who works for an ETL vendor? And whom do you work for, sir? Talent. Talent, yeah. Anybody else? So if you work for an ETL vendor, uh, Atlas is an, is an amazing integration point. We look forward to working with you uh, to bring that kind of end-to-end -end lineage to our enterprise customers. Uh, definitely engage me uh, so we can work together on uh, enabling that functionality. Yeah. Okay, you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Are you on? I guess so. Yeah. Okay, so let me take this question and then we can go there. So really quickly, um, Atlas, um, in many ways, uh, with regard to our partner group, is really a repository for metadata. So we can stash pretty much anything you send to us. Now, having said that, things that we already support, components that we already have that integration for, we do track that, right? So if you write some Hive SQL to do create table as select or whatever, we'll track that and we'll actually show that, right? If you're running a Falcon process and that process entity has some logic behind it, we'll actually show that as well, right? Now you can extend that as our partners do by adding their own logic. So you'll actually see that and we can talk about that. Element level lineage right now is not covered. It's in the roadmap. Uh, but let's, let's table some questions for now. I want to get to Mohan so we can actually get through the right. good stuff, right? Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Ajay, for the introduction. Hi, I'm Mohan Sadashiva, and I'm going to talk to you about waterline data and how we, of course, integrate with Atlas. Waterline data is a smart data catalog company. What we do is we help end users, such as business analysts and data scientists, to easily discover the data sets that they need to use for their analytics or reporting purposes. We uh, often compare ourselves or, or compare this to Amazon.com where it's pretty easy to go browse a catalog or search for products that you need, um, understand, compare, find, and select what you need, and of course have it delivered to your doorstep. And as waterline data, that's the kind of service we hope to provide to a big data lake environment. 
In order to do this, what we do is we um, profile all the files that are and the tables that are in the data lake. And from this, we gather a vast amount of metadata information. We classify, we categorize, and we um, map all the underlying data to the glossary so that when end users search for something using business terms that they understand, they're able to surface the right data sets. Finally, once they do surface the right data sets, they have to be able to take a set of actions against it. It might be to go to their favorite BI tool, or in the, as in the case of Trifacta, to go to a data prep tool, um, or perhaps just mark it for later use in a project. With that, I'm just gonna go quickly to the demo and uh, show you some of these things. Um, just as a final reminder, of course, this presentation is about our interface into uh, Atlas. The, um, the, all the metadata that we generate is then funneled back into Atlas, and I'll demonstrate how we do that. This includes tags, the uh, enriching the catalog that's in the business data catalog that's in Atlas, being able to enrich it with the lineage that we generate, and also in the reverse fashion to be able to take in the things that Atlas has to offer and manifest that in our product. And one of the things I'll demonstrate is how we take lineage that is generated in Atlas and show it as part of our product. So just switching over now. Typically, when a business analyst starts uh, uh, the interface into waterline is, is when they're looking for a particular data set. So let's imagine that they're looking for, say, um, something to do with claims transactions, as an example. They, as a result of a search, they probably get a large set of results as to possible data sets that they can use with their analysis. They can then further narrow down what they're looking for by you know, selecting uh, specific business terms that might be associated with, um, with that file or table, uh, where that file or table originated from, uh, data quality or date and time or ownership or any kind of facet. They can also uh, quickly look at thumbnail versions of um, metadata information such as ownership, such as lineage, and at a very high level decide which files or data sets they should investigate further. And once they narrow this down to a manageable number, they can of course go individually into each one of these files and at a glance be able to tell whether this is an appropriate data set for them. So in this case, uh, knowing how big the file is, what the data quality is in terms of uh, cardinality or number of non-null values, the kinds of fields that, th that are there, uh, the data that's in those fields, and most importantly, how those fields relate to the business glossary. So in this example, it shows you how waterline data suggests those relationship to the business glossary by these tags, along with the percentage of uh, probability of that match. This is really important because imagine if you had a, a big data environment with hundreds of thousands of files, being able to go into each file and table and being able to tag each element or field is going to be a very cumbersome and a, and a impractical prospect. So to be able to use some level of machine learning and automation to generate this association is really important. And in our view, having generated it, passing it back to Atlas so that the ecosystem at large can leverage that is also really important. So in this case, uh, I can show you how through the actions, for example, uh, there's a number of actions a, a person can take. They, if they don't have access to the data behind the file and they just have access to the metadata, they can request access. Uh, through a trouble ticketing system or a system admin. They can import lineage from Atlas, and let me just initiate that right now so that in a couple of seconds it will be here. We can export tags into Atlas, and, and of course, uh, we can wrangle this data with Trifacta, and I can show you how that works as well. So 
as I do this, let me go look at lineage. And as you can see here, uh, there is a certain amount of lineage that we generate, and then there's a certain amount of lineage that we have imported from Atlas that is also shown as part of the overall picture. The analyst can see this lineage and infer trust on the data set, and through this, add to the factors for their consideration as to whether this data set is appropriate for the use. And if you go into Atlas, let me just refresh this for a second. We can see if these tags are here. So if you see here, this is one of the tags that was exported, insurance transaction number, insurance policy number, and these correspond with these tags that you see here. So with the click of a button, you can uh, transfer all this. And of course, on a nightly basis, this can be transferred out in bulk as well. Now, the, the result of this is that all the metadata that is generated by Waterline and, of course, all the partner companies out here can be leveraged by a broader ecosystem that can then use this enriched data catalog and lineage information that Atlas has for their purposes. Uh, one final uh, demonstration, and this is a good plug for you, Alex, as you get into Trifacta. As you're in a business uh, intelligence tool like Tableau, Click, or a data prep tool like, like uh, Trifacta, uh, you only see the sources of data that are available to you. If you want to go beyond that, you need to know the exact location of data. And to remember that path and that that where that data is located is almost impossible. This is where you can search for information, and I'm going to use something that Alex is going to use to demonstrate later. For example, if you're looking for uh, trade trading information like trades, you can go search here, say with waterline data, and you go search, and that will open up a waterline data page and show you all the search results. You can then select the file that is appropriate for you through the mechanisms I described, like narrowing down through facets or looking at thumbnail information. And once you find something that is useful for you, you can then relaunch Trifacta back. And within Trifacta, it would launch you in context there. So here, as you can see on the right, it publishes the fact that Here's a resource that is now available for your use and you add it to your project. So within the Atlas ecosystem, partners can work together to bind their applications very closely together such that the handover between applications for an end user is really seamless. With this, I think I'm, I'm, I have two minutes more. I can either take questions or I can hand it off to the next person. Yeah, actually maybe we should um, wait for questions at the end. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, with this version of the product that we have, any web app can be launched as an action point, just like I showed you the example with Trifactor, but it could be anything else that can be invoked by a URL. I can take another question if you like while he's setting up, otherwise we can wait till the end. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry? Oh, with single sign-on. Typically, in this case, what happened is that the u it's at the user client level. So if the user has logged in through the browser before, that, cache, that information is cached. And of course, it facilitates the easy, um, you know, seamless integration. If not, in the case of Trifacta, for example, they get kicked back to a login page. You then log in, and then thereafter, it's seamless. Uh, the authentication for waterline data is, is anything that you use in the cluster, whether it's Kerberos or, or any other mechanism. We support the mechanisms that are present in the Hadoop cluster. Yes, go ahead. What, type, what data types like Parquet, Avro, yes. So we have a long list, all the common types like Parquet, Avro, ORC. And, with unstructured data, no, we are largely structured data.
Thank you. So over to you. Great. Hey, do you, um, you want to actually... Yeah. Actually, give me a second. Yeah, let's... Um, you know what? Let's switch it up a little bit. Let's, uh, let's put um, Alex on. Let's give him one second here. So are there any other questions? Maybe we can just take those right now. Maybe I can ask a question while they're switching. How many of you folks use a data discovery tool in your, uh, in your environment or even a, yeah? That's quite a few. And how about uh, data wrangling? No? Data wrangling, like data prep, data prep tools, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, after this session, we're going to have the birds of a feather session actually right here. Um, so we can actually get into the, uh, the details and show you actually what, what we mean by that. OK. All right. Connecting? With the, ah, magic. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so it looks like we <laughs> will continue, so. Joe, take it away, sir. Uh-oh, did we lose it? Little. Uh-oh, -oh. there we go. Okay, let's, uh, do you have one? Maybe it's the adapter issue. Yeah, I've got the two colors. Well, it's strong AI and the printer still won't work. This one help? Uh, is that HMI? No, oh, it's a VGA. Oh. Actually, wait, sorry. Do you, uh, do you, is there a VGA input? Okay. <laughs> yeah, HMI. <laughs> All right, this is a good question to see Who's what technical right aptitude adapter. we had. How many adapters do you have in your bag? <laughs> <laughs> No, VJ? No, no, we need a HDMI if you have. I do, yeah. Yeah, it's not on that one. Um, you know what, let's switch over to Trifacta, and then we can kind of, oh, wait, are you back? You cannot breathe on it. OK, cool. Go for it. All right, no, no, OK. You know what, just, just maximize it. Um, and then there's actually a, yeah, just don't even do it. Yeah, there you go. We're good. Thanks. OK, so. Um, Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so uh, I'm Joe Lichman. I'm from Ativio. Um, Ativio, what we do is we unify your data across silos. So, um, and really our goal is to look at the silos of data, unify that data to make it usable um, across, uh, across all these different sets. So yes, we, we, we are focused on Hadoop. That's why we're here. Um, but we don't want Hadoop to be yet another silo of data. Um, so Ativio connects to all different uh, types of sources. We connect to Teradata, Oracle, we connect to file systems, we handle structured and unstructured data because our belief is that all that data together um, is where analysts and, and your business will find insight. Um, just quickly, who we are, we're a leader in search, data discovery, and text analytics, um, according to Gartner and Forrester. Um, and what we're talking about today is what we call a semantic data catalog. Um, and in our view, governance is not just about controlling the data. In fact, it's about much more than that. And clearly, that's what, uh, what Atlas is about as well. It's about, it's about providing collaboration, a way for people to share their knowledge and transparency so people can understand the data they're looking for um, and how to use it. So what Ativio does, we catalog all the data from your enterprise inside and outside of Hadoop. We help you identify what's most relevant to the uh, business problem at hand, and then we unify this data, whether it's structured and unstructured, um, and we give you a visual model for doing that. And we think that's critical in that it's very rare that you're working with a single data set when you're doing analysis. Usually, you're trying to bring several data sets together in order to find information. Tibio is very focused on helping you unify that data, understand how it's connected. Um, and finally, we provision. Um, to leading BI tools, predictive analytics, um, click, rapid minor, we, 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 we 
build structure around that that allows even unstructured data to be analyzed in those tools. So that's what I, that was my setup. Let me go into the demo now. Let's hope this one also works. So this is uh, the front end of our tool. Um, the way to look at what we have here is these are what we like to call virtual data marts. These are each of these has information. Um, and if you look over here on the inspector side, this is a set of sources collected together. Um, and that if you wanted to, you could, if this, if this description met your business need, you could immediately um, provision it out to another tool, um, whether it's R, um, you could just uh, uh, extract all the metadata as JSON. Um, we could certainly move it to Trifacta or Paxata or someone to that effect. So that is, that's a, a key piece of our, of our business, of, our, of what our tool does, collecting that data and then helping in one click move it. And we don't require the data to be in a particular location. So we will federate that if there's data in, if one of the tables is in Teradata and another is in Hadoop, we'll bring those together, join them, and you can bring them through. So we'll go through the, quickly go through the process of you know, what this means. So this is sort of the Atlas show. I'm gonna create a workspace. If I can get down to the piece. I can add some metadata so that someone else can find it because again, about collaboration. I want people who I work with uh, to maybe share. Um, there was an error creating that Mart. Great. Um, so I will work with an existing Mart. I'll work within an existing one. So, this is sort of the, 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 uh, the process of finding data. If you look here, you can see that each one of these represents a source. Maybe it's a table, maybe it's a file, um, but you can go and search it. Um, when we pull that data in, um, in an automatic fashion, we, we, we tag all of the columns, we tag the data. We have a number of patterns that we can recognize out of the box. We understand that there's some, some, of, this, some of these columns have names, some have states, uh, some have stock tickers, some have zip codes, several, uh, almost 100 different uh, out-of-the-box configurations. You can also train the system and provide samples through the system to say, these are my product IDs. And if you do that, we will then recognize your product IDs across, across the system. So if you're looking for data, let's um, uh, the, 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 I might want to find something that's related to profitability. I'm trying to do an analysis on my department, uh, why it's not doing as well as I, as I would hoped. And you can see that there is uh, an orders table here, um, and it matches on adjusted net income. It also matches in these other tables. Um, in, in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a concept. In this case, it's uh, some text. But it is mapping the way the user talks about data um, to the way it's described in the data itself. Uh, so they were able to find this order table and they were able to work with that. You can also see that there's a lot of different tags. Some of these are produced by Tivio and some of these are produced by external systems like Atlas um, and some of them are produced by users using the tool and sharing them with others. The next step you would go through is this unify step. Um, so as you can see, there's uh, a set of, uh, of, uh, of of sources that are in here, and they're connected in this fashion on these on these joins. And we can we can execute these joins and bring this data in. You can also inspect how data can be related. We have this full um, graph of the relationships between the data, um, and how you might add more sources to work with. So if you sort of go and inspect it, you can see these different pieces. You can also dig into the data itself. That one doesn't have any links and add things like tags. So as to add a tag, if I simply wanted to do, you know, department ID, if I want to describe that this way, or, uh, or name or language, I add these. And as you can see, there's a, um, a broadcast. This is a broadcasted tag. This tag was picked up because another uh, source in the system was tagged, another column, as having category name. It went through all of the other pieces, found this, and then tagged that and tag this source with that, with that uh, example. Now, what are we doing with Waterline? I mean, we're not with Waterline, what are we doing with Waterline? What are we doing with Atlas? What we see with Atlas is a very uh, great opportunity to broadcast these tags out further, all the way back to the Hadoop cluster into Atlas, and to help users leverage, um, for example, their tag-based policy. So Tivio can run through all of the data and add Let's just add a tag to a source 
um, and just say, well, we have some that are PII, but if I go in here and I want to add on this category table, um, on a hive table, actually, let me find a hive table. It's, it's also in, uh, I know those are also in, um, in Atlas. So here's a number, of, a number of hive tables. I can go onto this table and tag it with, I'll tag this one with Andrew. And then this will be broadcasted automatically out to Atlas and it'll pick up that tag. So if you tag this table and there were other tables or other columns that had similar attributes, similar values, um, and had a similarity vector, it would push that off to, push that down, tag those other ones, and all those would also additionally be written out to Atlas for use. So I'll go to Atlas in a second. I'll go there a, a second. Um, we've added that, uh, that tag. Um, the final thing I wanted to, to, to show you is go to Atlas, and let's see if the Andrew tag has moved over yet. Let me make sure that it has set up. And there it is. It's moved in. It is on that table. If I go in and look at the tag on here, you can see that it's seeing all these different tags were created by Ativio's DSD product and moved into, into Atlas to be used however the Atlas uh, product is, is looking in the integration with Ranger. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is it's also bi-directional. So all of the lineage information that Atlas is generating can show up and allow our users to have that, uh, users of this tool to have additional metadata on the tables to understand the lineage, how it's built, to, how it's put together, give that visibility uh, that's so critical in our view in governance. Transparency, understand the data, uh, semantically and uh, and how it can be used. So, I'll I'll hand it off. So because we took Great. so much time. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Okay, and I think next we have Alex from Trifecta. Just leave that up there. Uh, yeah, he left the Great. Um, just to let you know, we are having another plug. We have a Birds of a Feather session after this. So if we spill over a little bit, we can basically just run right into that session. So. Okay, great. Three times. Working okay? uh, let's see, check, yep, check. Yep. Everybody in the back hear me okay? Yep. Perfect, thank you. All right, let's get this guy up here. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for sticking around. My name's Alex Rasmus, and I work for Trifacta. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what Trifacta does, who we are, and what our kind of integration point with Atlas is, and how that kind of works. Um, so if you've ever dealt with data before, if you're a data analyst or a data scientist or any, anybody that asks questions of data, you might think that the task of dealing with data is you ask a question, then you do some analysis, and then you get some blinding insight out. Everybody who's actually worked with data before knows that there's all this messy stuff that kind of happens in the middle, and Trifacta refers to that intermediate uh, those intermediate stages like discovery, structuring, cleansing, enriching, validation, and publication as data wrangling collectively. And Trifacta fundamentally is a product that puts the data wrangling task within reach of uh, folks who are uh, traditionally more analysts or data scientists. Um, so we do that. Where we kind of sit in the Hadoop ecosystem um, is we sit in between the kind of ingestion pipeline that gets your data into the Hadoop stack and the kind of analysis and reporting tools like your tableaus of the world that you use to analyze it. And we kind of help your data move from this raw kind of unstructured state that it's in when it enters HDFS to a structured state that can be analyzed. Our interaction with Atlas uh, is that as Trifacta operates, we're interacting with the Hadoop ecosystem a lot. So we're reading data off of HDFS, writing it to HDFS, running uh, jobs in systems like Pig and Spark, um, and we're publishing data to things like Hive tables. Uh, and of course, while all those things are happening, uh, metadata is being pushed by uh, Hortonworks into Atlas. Uh, but we are also publishing our own metadata into Atlas and linking it with that Hadoop metadata. So uh, the stuff that Trifacta is doing is visible as being related to stuff that is being done in Hadoop. 
So that's my kind of lead up. And now if, um, if the fates are kind, I will give you a demo. So Mohan has graciously kind of teed me up a little bit here. Um, this is the kind of view where people spend most of their time. I'm gonna to try to bump the size up a little so you can see it a little bit better on the screen. Um, so let's suppose for the sake of argument that I am a, an analyst at a financial services company and I want to take a look at the news ticker that I'm getting off of some system and correlate that news ticker information with information about stock trades to figure out maybe if there's any fraud. So if I'm getting this news ticker in, it might look something like this, where it's kind of very loosely structured, but there's a lot of free text. So one of the things you'll notice is that Trifacta has already kind of split the data up into rows and columns as best as it knows how for you. Uh, and this is all done automatically by us kind of looking at the data and trying to infer some structure. Um, we also attempt to figure out what type of data each one of the columns that we've inferred is. So for example, this first column here is, uh, is a date, and I've accidentally brushed, hold on. Uh. So this first column here is a date, um, and because it's a date, I can go and look at details about it and get a bunch of date type specific information, like a distribution over days of the week, or days of the month, or minutes of the hour. And there are a bunch of different kind of specific integrations that we have. We have a bunch of different types that are built into the system that can be automatically inferred. Um, and date is one of them that gives you a bunch of interesting information about the type. Additionally, we have some measure of how clean each one of these columns is. And we kind of define clean, cleanliness loosely as how much of the data in the column conforms to the type that we think it is. So in this example, you'll notice that there's this kind of bar up here at the top, and it says that some of the values don't conform to the date type. And if I wanted to, I could click on this little red part, and it would show me the stuff that didn't conform, and I could do something with it. And I'll do that in a second, but first, I notice that the first row in my data set looks like it contains header information. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna click on that first row, and you'll notice down here that based on that high-level click action, the system has tried to infer what I want. And the way that it decides what I want uh, is through a combination of heuristics and learning. So over time, the more people interact with the product, the better it gets at predicting what people want to do with it. In this case, it says, oh, you just clicked the first row. You probably want to promote that up and make it a header. So I'm going to do that. And you'll notice that all of my, come on. Oh, it's going to do this to me now, is it? Of course it is. Well, eventually it will show me that all of my first rows have been populated up to column names. But let's suppose that I wanted to do something like uh, take these mismatched values, and first I want to see which, which ones they are, so I can filter down my view to see which ones those are. And I can say, all right, well, I want you... I want to delete you. Oh, I see, it's like, well, let's keep going. And now you'll notice that my data set's a little bit cleaner. But in particular, I'm concerned about this free text field here. So one of the things I, I notice is that there are a bunch of these stock ticker symbols that are all in parentheses. So if I wanted to get those out into its own separate column, I can, what are you doing? I can, <laughs> I can select one of them, it's really hard to, click and drag on this podium, forgive me. There we go, there's the first one. Now the first thing it's gonna say is, well, that looks like the literal BBY in parentheses, and that's not super helpful, so I'm gonna try selecting a second one to give it more information about what I mean. And now it's kind of figured out, oh, you want uppercase characters with parentheses in closing them. Cool, I can give you that. And it says, well, do you want to like replace this with something? And this turns out we at first thought that the most popular thing that people would want to do is extract that out into a second column. But usage from our Trifactor Wrangler product, freely available for download on trifacta.com, um, showed us that uh, it turns out people want to replace more often than they want to extract. So I can select a different thing if it didn't get it right the first time. And you'll notice that it's going to give me a little preview here that just shows me what my column's going to look like after I add this to the script. So I'll add it to the script. 
And maybe I don't want these parentheses here, and it keeps thinking that I want to right click. So I'm going to select the left parentheses, and it correctly thinks that I want to get rid of those. And then I'm going to select the right parentheses, and it thinks that I want to get rid of those, so I will. So now I've kind of got this column of data with stock ticker symbols in it, and I want to actually go back and look at my trades and pull information about those trades into my data set. So what I'm going to do is a join. So I'm going to go in here to the join view, and now it wants to know what data set I want to join with. Well, I've already got this trades data set ready to go. Get a preview of that. And you know, this looks pretty clean because we've already cleaned it up in the past and it's got things like the tickers and the times and dates and prices. So that looks good. I'm gonna go under selecting join keys. The next thing you'll notice is that it automatically decided that I was going to, that I wanted to join the ticker column with the new column that I derived and that's all done through a, a join inference tool that runs on the server side. Um, but if I didn't like that, uh, that join prediction, I could go into this little editor view and pick a different one. I'm gonna pick, the, pick that one though, because I like it. And I wanna pull in all the other columns from both of the data sets. So then I add that to the script. And just like that, I have a join. And if you wanna see, you know, now we've kind of got this big free text column and there are a bunch of other columns here that we can't really see without scrolling around. So there's this little view on the left that gives you a bunch of kind of the same sorts of metadata that you'd see, but then of course you can see that there's a bunch of these different columns. Now I can keep going and, and cleaning this stuff up, but once you're done kind of constructing your cleaning task, the next thing you might wanna do is run that operation over all of your data at once. And so we can run a job, and you'll notice here that we can, we support various kinds of compression and a bunch of different data formats. Um, we infer which engine you wanna run the data on based on how big it is, um, but you know, for now we support running both on our server side and uh, in Hadoop. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip to what the results of one of those jobs would look like. Uh, it doesn't like my zoom level, so I'm gonna zoom back out to 100%. There we go, now it went away. So this kind of metadata view here shows you what the overall kind of structure of the global data set was post um, running this transformation task on the whole thing. Um, and you'll get information like for categorical data, you'll get um, top K for numeric data, you'll get a histogram. And you'll also get information about the, some sample rows in your data that still have a cleanliness problem. So for example, um, there are a couple rows in here that look like we've got a date that's malformed, for example. And um, when these tra batch transformation jobs run, metadata about the job is automatically pushed into Atlas, and I'll show you that here now. So this is kind of the, the latest, greatest Atlas version, which it wants me to log back into for some reason. Cool, and we're back. Um, so the first thing we do is we effectively, everything we touch, we tag with trifecta. So here's a list. Come on, there we go. Here's a list of all the things that we've touched in this, in this Atlas instance. You'll notice here that there are different kinds of types. So we touched a hive table, we also touched a couple different, or we created a couple different kinds of jobs. There was a wrangle job, which is the job that actually runs that transformation on the whole thing. And there was also a published job that you can do to take the results of your transformation job and push them out to something like Hive or Redshift. Um, now if I look at my sample little wrangle job here, our integration with, at this point is a little bit spare, but you'll notice that I've got information like when it started, when it stopped, um, and I have a link to the script itself which has information about its name and um, its, tra its transform list would show up here. This is still a little bit beta. And for publication jobs, I have things like, again, when it started, when it stopped, some information about it, but I also have a link to the Tive table that it published to. And when you look at that hive table, you'll get all the kind of nice lineage that, that Atlas gives you already. 
So information like columns and so forth. That's pretty much all I've got. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So, um, we're, so we've got a few minutes. We can take a few questions. If there are questions beyond our scheduled time, which is at, I think 5 o'clock, we can carry over to the Birds of a Feather session afterwards. Um, I just want to really thank um, our partners up here. We kind of put this together very quickly, um, so it's actually a, a great testament to the agility that they have. And you know, this is really you know, building out and really extending the capabilities we have in the ecosystem. So you know, many thanks to you guys. Heads off. Okay, any questions? I, I'll walk around and try to take the mic to you. Just raise your hand. Oh, yes, sir. So, question is for the trifecta team. Uh -huh. Can you actually provide these cleansing rules? Can I give a human readable DSL kind of thing? Yes, the, the, so the, the language that, um, that these rules are expressed in is reasonably human readable at present. Um, one of the big things that we're working on um, for uh, future release is making a kind of much more human readable layer on top of them. Um, you can also export these, these things out in like a text file form. So they're, they're meant to be fairly easy for humans to parse. And I don't know if you noticed this um, before. It's, it's easy to miss. But uh, when we do things like the kind of it's effectively regular expression inference from doing selection. Uh, you'll notice that we didn't give you a big gnarly regex. We gave you things like you know, upper in curly braces. Um, that translates to regexes, but you know, humans don't like reading those, so we don't show them to you. Yes, it, could be a, it could be a complicated rule, and since you may have to run against the data, meaning like an Informatica or a talent job, uh, you may want to run or even a HDF job to actually uh, apply on the data. To, to cleanse. Essentially, what you're doing is you're cleansing the data. You got your data, you want to cleanse it, I can cleanse it anyway. I can just run a simple rule like you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But that, that could be, you may want to run a complicated rule because you may want to run, uh, leverage some of the capabilities. Uh, if, so if you're talking about user-defined transformations, we support that too. Um, okay, another question? Anybody else? Thank you. Yes, sir. So most enterprises uh, don't just have Hadoop. So the combination of Atlas and the tools from you guys, I mean, how, how do those tools fit into uh, a heterogeneous uh, environment that's got an EDW and a, in Teradata and SQL Server databases to take account of metadata and lineage? That, well, that, um, that is one of the, that's at least, Tivio connects to all those, and that's our, our, our view is that whether you call it a data lake, you call it the enterprise, the, the data, it, the, as much as we would like the people here, we all would like all data to be in Hadoop, it's not. It's not a reality. Um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's data in the cloud. So Tivio is focused on visibility across those um, and to integrate with those tools. So Atlas you know, could very well be the right place uh, to, to, to put metadata on all the uh, information. That, that, that's, that's, a, a business, that's a decision an enterprise can make. Um, and the same thing with sort of, you know, trifactor. There's no, there's no requirement, I don't believe, to say this data is in dupe, that's where it needs to be cleansed. Right. Um, and in fact, our experience says that frequently what people are trying to do are merge these data sets in some way. Sometimes data sets that are just on someone's laptop and this needs to be loaded up. So that's one of our focuses. Yeah, I think that, that's a great point. Uh, just a quick comment, I'll come on right over there. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is obviously create this ecosystem where we can house all this metadata. And we really want to exchange metadata. We can do it a couple of ways, obviously through our partner network. We can also um, grab data um, by uh, batch mode through an interchange format as well as having you know, connectors actually write to our REST APIs. Now from the perspective of uh, Teradata, we have a Teradata connector. It actually sits on top of Scoop. So that aspect of it is actually captured. So that technical metadata is captured. Um, you would have to do a little extra work to get the business metadata in, but we do capture that capability. And our friends at Comcast. <laughs> Hi there. Um, when, you, uh, when you say uh, that Ativio handles all data sources. I'm afraid I don't believe you. Um, oh. <laughs> what? And I'm sure you don't. You're really, right. <laughs> I'm sure you don't really mean that. Um, so what? 
what do you really work with, and is there a way, do you have like an API that, that enables us to extend and, and add things like, like Atlas has, say? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an open API. Uh, so we are an API-driven RESTful uh, Java APIs as well. Um, by all, I mean all types. So we're not relational. We don't, we don't need relational uh, data. That's one type we handle. Um, we handle unstructured um, really well. We're actually, are, at our, our heritage is a search engine. So we take in unstructured data and we build structure around it. We can handle uh, semi-structured. So yes, they, I'm sure there are binary formats we wouldn't know what to do anything with, but we certainly can handle um, Avro files and, and Parquet files and other, other uh, types of files. So that, that is part of what we do. Um, and yes, the, you, can, you can bypass our systems and, and, uh, um, and directly um, define workflows. If you want to do additional uh, analysis, you can hook in other systems as well into the workflow and you can interrogate the system using either SQL, uh, we have a SQL interface for our, for our index or our, uh, our query language, which allows you to express Boolean expressions and things of that. I was thinking of things like um, uh, a graph database which is neither SQL nor, uns not, you know, it's neither fish nor fowl. Yeah, I mean, we store, as you saw, the relationships between the data. So there is a graph, uh, but I would not call us a graph database. We have uh, a graph capabilities. Can we connect to a graph database? Um, we haven't tried, but we, we, can, we can look. We, actually, we, HBase, if you consider that a graph, no, okay, fair enough. I, <laughs> we do connect to HBase. Yeah, or Titan. Yeah. not today. <laughs> Well, we have a, a, I mean, that's the whole point of having that ecosystem. So you can actually leverage a tibia for what it can do, but then also integrate with other partners, right? So the, the whole point is that we have a common metadata store, which is Atlas. I'm completely biased. I'm the product manager for that. So uh, <laughs> there we go. Any, uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. I think we've got time for maybe one or two, and then we'll kind of uh, go to the birds of a feather session, if you like. So where's the, uh, when you said for Activio, when you have multiple sources you know, joining that, where's that actual join happening? What engine is it using? Do you define that? If you have so, so we have, a, we have a, a virtualization layer. So we, we push down the, if, there, if there's tables and, 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 uh, and work that we can do in the primary, in the source database, we'll push those down. Uh, but if we're joining across databases, yeah. we'll bring that up and join that in Activio and then hand that over. Um, there are integrations with other virtualization engines if, that, if that's desired. There's uh, an integration we've done with Composite, for example, where if you want to use that as an example. So how does that scale? Because I was thinking in terms of like if you have a Hive table and you have a Teradata relational database and you're working with Petabyte with the data, how is that scaling when you're doing that join in Activio? So, I mean, you know, hopefully you're filtering uh, <laughs> the, the petabytes before you move it into, into Tableau or something to that effect. It's not gonna, gonna handle it. A lot of what we're trying to support is sort of ad hoc um, views. If you're looking for something at that scale, our, our, we would recommend using more of a, uh, of, uh, a stream into something like Hive or into Hadoop so you, we bring those tables in and we've, we have that as part of our API as well. Part of system. Okay. Um, anybody on this, uh, the vendor side, do you, if, do you guys want to add any comments to that? No. Okay. No. Thank you Great. for your, thank you, Andrew, for setting this up. Sure, no problem. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I know that our, it was a kind of a, a lot of uh, last minute changes in terms of the schedule, so really appreciate you guys sticking it out, coming to the last session <laughs> on the last day. So uh, you guys should get a special award. Anyways, okay. that's it for us. Uh, the decks will be uploaded as, I think we also may have a video um, as well. In any case, it'll be presented. We're gonna have a birds of a feather session, so if you have additional questions, uh, we can get into the details there as well. Great, thank you very much.